All right, super funny guy. He's all over TikTok, Instagram, and you may remember him from a series of online commercials from Bed Bath & Beyond, a slightly apathetic employee. But, you know, very funny. Netflix is a joke radio. Also, the tour is starting in August throughout the fall, and it's just a, a super, super funny guy that we have here on the show. Joining us is Ryan Goodcase. Ryan, how you doing, man? Good, good. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to be here. <laughs> I was digging into your bio, and yeah. I know hey, you that you are. The, uh, sorry, you pulled out the Bed Bath and Beyond credit in the beginning. That was uh, that was a deep dig. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I was doing some research, and you know, I was trying to figure out exactly where you were born, and it just says "humble boy from the Midwest." And I'm like, I got to get more specific than that, and I could not figure this thing out. So. I'm going to ask you where specifically in the Midwest, because I think you're seeing him, yourself right there in a photo with a mighty ducks hat. So I'm wondering yeah. if it was, if it's hockey country that you grew up in. That's an, that's a very astute observation. Yes, it is hockey country. Uh, I was born, I was born in Illinois out like 30 minutes outside of Chicago, but I spent most of my childhood uh, in South line, Michigan, which is right by Ann Arbor. So we go to Joe Louis arena and Yost arena and watch hockey there. Oh, amazing. So you yeah. remember the you remember the dynasty days of the Red Wings and I yeah. and all those dudes back in the 90s and 2000s then. Yeah, I got spoiled on that. And then uh, when they had a rough seven years of no playoffs, that's when I started buying Mighty Ducks hats and expanding my, <laughs> my repertoire of teams that I wrote. Have you thrown an octopus onto the ice? Uh, no, I've never even touched an octopus. I think I'd be a little too squeamish for that. Have you ever eaten octopus? Uh, fried, not okay. raw. Okay. Fried octopus delicious though. Yes. Yeah. I think anything fried you can get away with. I don't, even if it's a disgusting sea creature, you can eat it fried. Especially in, in the outskirts of Chicago. At that point in time, everything is fair game to fry and eat at like a state fair. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've not <laughs> outgrown that palate. I've been living in California for over six years and I still reach for the mayo and the ranch and, uh, <laughs> can't beat a cheeseburger. While everybody is reaching for their smoothies and their kale and their acai yeah. bowls, you're the one looking for the mayo, extra mayo on my uh, my Chicago dog. Yeah, exactly. Have fun, you know, living to the ripe age of 80, eating, uh, you know, fruit smoothies and other stuff that's going to make your life depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the deadpan delivery that you have, and it does feel very upper Midwest. You know, other guys uh, might be a little bit more uh, vivacious or in your face or loud, but for you, I think so much of your humor is your delivery. Have you always approached stand-up in that kind of deadpan way? Yeah, I would say so. I think, uh, you know, it might be less of a deliberate artistic choice and more just that's kind of how I am as a person. So yeah. rather than try to fight against it and be something I'm not and be really, uh, you know, performative, I was just like, uh, I'll go the other way and be as, you know, deadpan and monotone as possible and just have to write good enough to make it worth watching. <laughs> this this week. When when we were getting ready to have you here on the show and reaching out to you, et cetera, you know, both Aiden and I were watching the clip of the 60 second timing, your perfect timing mm -hmm. on a joke. And man, you know, if people haven't seen that, we can send this out on our social page. But you're like, ask one of the one of the audience members to count backwards from 60 seconds to show how mm -hmm. good your timing is. And the last joke is how many women you actually slept with in college and you keep right. waiting and keep waiting and keep waiting. And then you point to him and he says, there's two seconds left in this time. And he said, that's exactly the right number. And we were both just howling with <laughs> laughter. So how do you, how do you create an engineer a joke like that? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of, like a lot of jokes. I can't point to exactly how I came up with it or wrote it, but that one is actually really easy. Um, because I was trying to get passed at this comedy club in San Francisco called Punchline. And there's an audition process there where when you're new, you go to the Sunday showcase, you hope you get up and you hope that you have a good set so that they consider passing you and you can work there. Um, but what I was worried about is they, uh, you get a light when you uh, have like a minute left or two minutes. And I was very used to a two minute light, but I knew there they give a one minute light. It's very important you stay on time. You're not supposed to go over. So I was freaking out about going over once I got this one minute light. And then I just had the idea of like, oh, what if I had an audience member count down for a minute? 
um, to, to keep me on track, sort of a nonsense <laughs> thought, wasn't expecting it to be anything. But then I like thought, like, how could that be a joke? And the first two numbers came naturally, like the 19 blank. And then I don't know how old that would be, but it'd probably be older than blank. Uh, so that came like really quick after that idea. And then I think my natural inclination is just to be self-deprecating and uh, like, oh, what's a, <laughs> what number would be funny? Oh, the number of women I slept with. That's a funny number. So that's how the end got written. <laughs> it's really, really funny. So you are, you know, you're, you're in LA and this is now a stand up kind of world and it's a really cool world for comedy in that way. And we've had a lot of comedians join us here on the show and they each have their own different style. But I wonder when you go and you work the clubs and you do stand ups and specials, et cetera, are you looking at what other people are doing and saying, Oh, that, that kind of works. Maybe I can weave something in of my, you know, my own style, but to that type of idea or because it's so hyper competitive, do you have to be so different from everybody else's um, content? I definitely strive for the latter. Like I, I try to write stuff that's either in response or parroting what everybody else is doing. Like you think I'm going to talk about one thing because everyone else is, but then I take it another direction. Mm, yeah. um, or it's just something that's very unique that I haven't seen done before, like the countdown. I do really try to stand apart because there is so much content there's so much content online and i go to so many shows so i see so many of the same jokes and ideas and similar premises and you know they might be good they might be great but when you see so much comedy you get sick of it and you're like okay i want to do something different that's where i come from is the boom in stand-up right now happening because social media can kind of blow torch new comedians, new ideas to a bigger audience? Or do you think it's a generation of comics that grew up on a certain type of comedy and now are kind of coming to their own? Is it YouTube needs content and so more people have more specials? But how is this happening? Because it feels like comedy is really having a, an incredible moment right now. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, I guess something similar happened with music and youtube maybe like a decade ago or 20 years ago where people are being discovered off youtube like justin bieber and it was just like uh cutting out the middleman like you could just go out and sing and put it on video and i don't know if that happened as much with stand-up but i think this new format of tiktok and reels where you can just take a joke whether it's 60 seconds or a minute and a half people can scroll through just hear like a tight joke done by somebody and then decide from that point you know do I want to follow them? Do I want to check out their other stuff? Um, and then that mixed in with like podcasts taking off and you get to actually like hear people talk and hopefully that makes them more interesting. I am worried whenever I go on a podcast or an interview that people will hear that and be like, okay, I actually don't like his comedy. Anymore. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's funny that you say that because Hawk Tour Girl did her first interview last week and uh -huh. it was kind of a long form interview. And she's the biggest thing in the world right now. And everyone wants a t-shirt that says Hawk Tua. There's a joke behind every door of Hawk Tua. And then I, I heard the interview and I said, I don't know if she should have done that. Because she yeah. seems, you know, the more quiet you are, the more mysterious you are, the more interesting you are. Once you totally. actually do a long form interview, you now you have to be interesting. And yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know if she's all that interesting beyond that. Yeah, I feel for her because that's a tough position to be in. She oh, certainly no. wasn't expecting to blow up like that in that street interview. Um, but I know exactly what you mean. And I, I think I do just lean towards, you know, uh, that there's a quote, right, by Tom Sawyer or something like uh, it's best to just to keep quiet um, and have people think that you're an idiot rather than open your mouth and prove them right or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I think with me when i perform uh, and i have a good show people will come up and try to talk to me afterwards and i won't be as interesting or as clever or or i'll be awkward which is what i joke about being on stage like oh i weren't ex wasn't expecting you to actually be awkward i'm like yeah i was telling the truth this is how i am <laughs> i'm sorry i wish you would have just gone home after the set and not ruined your <laughs> perception of me on stage but well that's because... the right to do that you, because you have that persona, are people from your past childhood friends, classmates, et cetera, maybe family members surprised that you got into comedy where you have to perform and make people laugh? Absolutely. I don't think anyone in my family <laughs> saw that coming. <laughs> uh, 
maybe my parents could see an inkling of that but like anyone like cousin or aunt and uncle like i was always the quiet kid at the family function um so i think that they're very surprised and then to have like my born again christian aunt watch my special and see me do jokes about like squirting uh <laughs> makes me cringe a little bit so i try not to think about them watching my comedy <laughs> But I it's think their good. image of me as a quiet boy, innocent boy, has been uh, irrev irrevocably damaged. Yeah, you shattered that. So congratulations. Yeah. Every Thanksgiving <laughs> from here on out is a complete uncomfortable, awkward silence. Yeah. So it's it's perfect that you grew up in uh, in Michigan, spent a lot of time there, because the picture that we have of you that's so Detroit Rock City, the movie from, I guess it's late 90s, early 2000s, that was a throwback to like the Kiss era in the 1970s, mm -hmm. where the guys have all the long hair, the hat, and the jeans jacket there. I yeah. know your hair wasn't always super long like that, but yeah. it, it's, it's a great look. So do you feel like you're rocking a throwback look? Uh, I guess so. You know, I've been all over the place with, uh, my look and I am pretty like, I guess, self-conscious about my image. And I think recently I've stopped caring as much, which is manifested in this haircut, which I, you know, <laughs> well, I got one on a podcast recently with two guys and they're like, you have to start putting product in your hair. It looks horrible. And I, you know, I did a mirror check before this, but now I see sweat on my brow. My hair looks greasy. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? I just got to go punk rock and not care and hope that, uh, hope that it works. Is that where the hellfire t-shirt comes from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, just put on some obscure band t-shirt that no one will appreciate and, uh, we'll see what happens. Is that the band name or the album? It's the album. So super obscure. <laughs> okay. And so what's the band name? Uh, Black Midi. Black Midi. Is that yeah. an old band, a new band? Uh, they're relatively new. They've got like three albums out. But it's funny. I actually had an experience with them. We're talking about like meeting them after the show. I saw them in New York. They did a free show in Central Park. And then the next day they were selling their own merch in Washington Square Park just during the day the band members were. And I got a chance to like talk to the lead singer who was very similar to me and that they're very awkward and can't really hold a conversation. <laughs> and it was just like two like unmovable forces going at each other of uh, social anxiety. And uh, I just walked away from that. Like I didn't need that experience. I should have <laughs> just, <laughs> I should have just kept it as a band that I've never uh, talked to the people before. But So, so how do you figure being awkward around people and yet being comfortable on stage talking to a room full of people? Yeah. Yeah. People ask that a lot to me. It makes a lot of sense because what's scary about, a conversation is not knowing where it's going to go or not knowing what you're going to say. Oh. But with stand up, at least when I first started, I can plan everything, you know, months in advance and then I can tweak it. Like if something goes wrong, I can fix it for the next time. Um, I've abandoned that like rigid format a little bit. Like I don't stick quite as uh, much to a script as I used to. But when you're doing stand up, you're just in control. You know, you're not being talked to. You picked what to say. You picked the topics to talk about. So uh, it's kind of like someone with social anxiety's dream. <laughs> like you get full <laughs> control. I've never had a problem with public speaking. I don't know what it was. It's just like uh, interpersonal stuff is what's awkward for me. That's so funny. You know, the I mean, the most deadpan delivery that I can remember in comedy, an iconic deadpan delivery, Stephen Wright. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was doing it probably back in the early 80s or so, did you watch a lot of Stephen Wright when you were growing up or kind of like tweaking your your performance? I definitely saw some of them growing up, but I saw him live maybe three or four years ago for the first time. Uh, and I remember he, like he'll just come out, you know, to big applause, everyone going crazy, he just goes up to the mic and just goes, hey, and that gets a giant laugh. <laughs> yeah, like, I know. Yeah. First word, no expression, huge laugh. And, uh, like that was, uh, that's a memorable moment for me. I'm like, okay, there's, uh, there's some, definitely some skill and artistry to the, the deadpan thing. And I mean, how much equity do you have to build up to where yeah. the crowd is waiting for you to say, Hey, and the yeah, they, yeah. Hey, they erupt. That's pretty, that's pretty legendary. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I get so paranoid about like posting my jokes and having people come see me live. And if I do the same joke, I'm like, Oh, you know, th they hate it. 
But when I saw Stephen Wright, you know, I had heard maybe a third of those jokes before, and I still laughed just as hard the first time. Like, they're just that good. It's why a lot of comedians only do crowd work now in their social media is that they're yeah. going to click on something in the crowd. That way they can post it on social media and they don't have to waste their content on an audience that hasn't seen them live yet. But I don't know. I kind of feel like you. I I think I'd rather see comedians do their best stuff on social media, hook me in. And if I see that again in the act, that's OK, because if I thought it was really good on social. I want to see it again live. Yeah, I think. uh I, I think it's smart that you picked up on that. That's why there is a lot of crowd work. But I think there's a general negative opinion about that. I see more people complaining about crowd work clips than I see people like, you know, enjoying them. Um, and I, I was a little precious with that 60 second countdown joke. You know, I didn't post that for a while. I've had it for a while, but I just wanted, you know, a good recording of it so that it could get a good reach. And so I was happy I waited until I got to do the Netflix as a joke fest um set because they're you know recording obviously they're netflix they're going to do a great job uh and i kind of attribute that to part of the reason why that clip did so well so you know some of my jokes i'm like okay i can uh, i like these but i can make more so i'll just post them but that one i held on to for a while you know and also crowd work it's you could be a really funny comic and not do crowd work that well and so yeah. sometimes you see crowd work and it's like a c effort because crowd work's really hard. You're trying to riff on something that may or may not have just happened yeah. and tied into something. And that really doesn't necessarily speak to how good your written performance would be. So it seems like it could be also kind of a little undercutting of your own stuff if your crowd work isn't as good as your stage work. Definitely. And also crowd work, I think, just in general is a hundred times better in person. Like when you're yeah. in the room and you can see the person that they're talking about, like you feel like you're part of something and that it's something special. But when you're just watching on your phone, you lose a lot of that, I think. No doubt. You have the tour coming up here starting in August, and that's going to run August, September, November. First shows are in the Pacific Northwest, Portland, August 21st, Seattle, August 22nd, then through California, mid-September. So what are you looking forward to most with the tour coming up later this summer? I mean, this is like my first time touring as a headliner, um, and that's exciting, you know, feeling like you're finally making this work, this thing I've been doing for 10 years. Uh, but I'm also, one thing I'm excited about is like getting to know what my audience is. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I, I'm used to performing on shows where it's just a comedy show and you don't know who's there. But now as performing, like Build is running a good case, I get to see the people who like come out to my shows. Uh, and that's fun. Like I was just in Pittsburgh and someone had me take a picture with their service dog. And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'll do that. But then they left the picture. So it's just me and their service dog. <laughs> like, oh, OK, this is this is my audience. <laughs> and I joke like, oh, yeah, I feel like my audience is a lot of introverts who don't have a lot of friends, which is horrible for <laughs> ticket sales. But like I like having a crowd like that. <laughs> Everybody that buys a ticket to your show is always just one ticket. Nobody yeah, has yeah, exactly. to <laughs> And they're all sitting away from each other. So it's just a very disparate crowd. <laughs> uh, you're coming through New York in late September, the New York Comedy Club, which is awesome. Would love to catch up with you because we're based here in New York. Oh, but sure. also you got Chicago in October as well. So do you still have a crew in Chicago that will come support you and uh, come out to your show, friends or family? I have some family there and I have some people who I, you know, went to school with in Michigan that now live in Chicago. I left Chicago when I was six years old as a kid. So I don't think anyone from that period will be there. Okay, so no <laughs> kid might... classmates. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, that would be a surprise. Anyone could claim they were and I wouldn't remember. I'd be like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the Midwest in general usually comes out in pretty good numbers for my shows. People, people like the Midwest uh, hometown hero. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really yeah. great. So yeah, check out the the tour. It's on his website, RyanGoodCase.com. Ryan Goodcase on all of the social media platforms as well. TikTok, Instagram are great places to find it as well. And uh, as we mentioned before, you have the special also. Maybe they're dead, the comedy special and tour. So you got a lot of stuff cooking. So, man, congratulations and everything. Thanks so much for catching up. Maybe when you're in New York, we'll catch up in person. And uh, if not, go Mighty Ducks. All right. Sounds good. Thank <laughs> you, DA. You got it, man. Thanks Thank you. Me.